Just to recap, the shared common ancestor of all modern day tetrapods was an aquatic lobe fin fish that underwent a variety of structural and physiological changes to give you uh, fully terrestrial modern day tetrapods like we know them today. And some of these changes included skeletal and muscular remodeling so that the animals could support themselves against the force of gravity, the development of new uh, organs for respiration, including lungs, and the ability to undergo respiration via the mouth and skin. And then finally, um, ways of uh, withstanding fluctuations in environmental conditions, um, because there are a lot more environmental conditions that will change very quickly and without notice in terrestrial environments that don't nearly happen as drastically in aquatic environments. And so some of the first uh, terrestrial tetrapods that we find were the amphibians. And amphibians um, include modern day frogs, salamanders, and caecilians. Um, in this lecture, we'll talk in a, about uh, frogs and salamanders in a lot more detail. Uh, we won't really talk much about caecilians, but uh, if you've ever seen one, this is what they look like. They are a form of limbless amphibian. And what amphibians are is basically in their name. Their, may, their name boils down to double life. And they're called this because even though they're terrestrial, they still require moisture in order to survive. So people will sometimes refer, them, refer to them as quasi-terrestrial. And they require moisture for two main things. One, for reproduction. Their eggs do not have a shell. They are considered to be anamniotes. So in order for their young not to dry out, they have to uh, lay their eggs either in water or in very moist environments. If they don't do so, then their embryos will dry out. Um, if you wanna see a picture of what some frog eggs look like in the Anurin slide, um, I put a picture and you can see the frog eggs and how similar they look to the eggs of fish. And they also require moisture for respiration. The um, frogs and salamanders and, and toads use their skin as a secondary respiratory organ. And in order for respiration to occur across the skin, the skin must be moist. Um, if their skin dries out, then they cannot undergo respiration using the skin and they won't be able to get as much oxygen as they need. So they require moisture even though they live in, on terrestrial environments. All amphibians are ectotherms, which means that they do not have internal ways of regulating their body temperature. They must rely on environmental conditions to do so. So they'll spend more or less time in the sun um, in order to um, increase or decrease their body temperature appropriately. Most amphibians undergo metamorphosis. Um, so they go from an egg, some sort of larva, um, to a juvenile of some sort, and then to an adult form. And the um, different life stages of amphibians tend to vary in morphology and, and habits quite greatly. And so we'll talk about some of the life cycles of amphibians in the next couple slides. And something to note about amphibians is that they're very sensitive to changes in their environment. And this is because their skin is very thin and porous because they use it for respiration, which means that they're left very susceptible to various changes in their environment. Um, if the environment gets too warm or if there's a new introduction of a disease or pathogen into the environment or there's a pollutant that's introduced into their habitat, they respond to this. So we're finding that many amphibians are actually um, becoming endangered or threatened because of climate change. So climate change obviously has an effect if the temperature are warmer or more arid, then they're not able to stay as moist as they need to be in order to undergo respiration or to keep their, uh, their eggs and their embryos alive. But in addition to this, um, increases in uh, climate, um, climate conditions also facilitate the spread and uh, yeah, the spread of pathogens um, from organisms within the population. So we're starting to see diseases running rampant um, within different uh, amphibian species. And then also the introduction of pollution into their environments is killing off a lot of amphibian species as well. So we have to keep amphibians in mind because they are a really good indicator of the health of a particular environment because they're so susceptible to environmental changes. And without them, we would be in serious trouble. They're a big portion a uh, very important component of the various ecosystems around the planet. Salamanders are tailed amphibians that belong to order Urodella, and that's actually where they get their name from. Urodella is referring to the fact that these are amphibians with tails. 
And salamanders can undergo respiration using either lungs, gills, or their skin, or a combination of all three. It just depends on the life cycle, the lifestyle, and the different species of salamander that you're looking at. But for those salamanders that will develop lungs, they have lungs at birth but their lungs um, when they're born are underdeveloped and non-functional. And then as the uh, salamanders undergoing metamorphosis, their lungs will develop, become functional, and then by the time they reach adult, the whole adulthood, they'll be able to use their lungs um, on land. Salamanders undergo internal fertilization and they use a spermatophore to reproduce. So we talked about spermatophores before when we talked about insects. Um, these are just these packets of sperm that the male will deposit onto a twig or a leaf or something like that. And the female then comes by and will um, uptake the sperm from the spermatophore into her reprodu reproductive tract. Um, the vast majority of salamanders undergo metamorphosis. However, some terrestrial species will undergo direct development. So once they hatch from their eggs, um, they'll just be really small versions of the adult. And then there's a very interesting feature of salamanders called pedomorphosis that some species will undergo. And pedomorphosis is, uh, literally means child form. And this is the retention of ancestral juvenile features in sexually mature adult individuals. So you can see an example looking at this cute little axolotl here. And you can see these uh, perinebrachia here. These are actually a form of gills. And this is a uh, feature that's present in juveniles or also is as an ancestral juvenile feature. It's generally not in, uh, a part of the adult life of um, a salamander. However, this like this axolotl or mud puppies will retain these gills throughout their lives. And so this is a really uh, unique characteristic of some salamanders. Now, these uh, some species these uh, juvenile characteristics can be lost depending on certain circumstances. So some of them will maintain these juvenile features um, once they're early in their sexual adulthood. And then as they continue through life, they'll lose them. Uh, some of them, they're environmentally triggered. So they, um, let's say this mud puppy, uh, you have a mud puppy that's living in a space or axolotl that's living somewhere where um, their water system dries out. And now they only have two choices. They can stay there and die or they can go somewhere else. Um, if they're given those two choices, they'll lose these uh, juvenile features and then their lungs will develop and then they can become fully terrestrial. And then some have no choice. Um, if, they're, if their uh, lake dries out, then they're screwed. Um, they cannot develop the adult lungs. Um, they will just die because they only have these, um, these gills. And this pedomorphosis has been found to be regulated by thyroid hormones as well as the pituitary gland. So if the levels of thyroid hormones are incorrect or if the pituitary gland is underperforming, then these structures will be maintained in the adults. Frogs and toads belong to order Anura, and these are the amphibians that lack a tail in their adult form, which is where their name comes from. And anurans have a very unique skeletal structure. One thing that's unique about them is their skull. Their skull is very lightweight because it has less ossification than any other vertebrates on Earth. And it also has this very flattened profile and is composed of fewer bones than the average vertebrate skull. So this is a very unique feature to anurans. They also have a kind of shortened body that focuses most of the power into their hind limbs. So their musculature as well as their skeletal system is structured so that they can have very, very powerful hind limbs for jumping and swimming. And you can see that kind of shortened body structure when you look at the skeletal system here. You can see how they have very few vertebrae. And then their um, coccyx has been extended into this long, a structure called a uro style, as well as uh, their whole region in their uh, posterior area of their body is designed to help them be very effective jumpers and swimmers. And then anurans, in addition to having lungs because they're terrestrial, they often use their skin as their secondary respiratory organ. And their skin is very thin, it's always kept moist, and it's loosely attached to the body. In addition to that, it's also keratinized. 
And so I included this diagram here to kind of show you what the skin of neurons looks like. Um, you don't need to know everything that's in this diagram, but I thought it was important to show you some key characteristics, um, specifically the different glands. And so there are a variety of mucus glands present in the skin of a neurons that produce a nice uh, coating of mucus all over the skin. And this is important for keeping them moist. Um, if their skin dries out, they won't be able to undergo respiration um, or gas exchange via the skin. So these mucus glands are constantly putting out mucus so that they can keep the skin moist so they can use it for gas exchange. They also have poison glands that are excreting um, poisons that will coat the body as well. And these poisons help to protect from predators. Um, a variety of neurons have various uh, potencies of, of poison. Some like poison dart frogs, like this picture up here, have very, very potent poisons um, on their skin. And humans have made use of these poisons um, throughout history. Um, but some have a far more mild poison for at least to us as humans um, that won't kill us, but it is still an effective deterrent for predators. And then they also have chromatophores in their skin as well. And this is what gives them their color. So these chromatophores can expand or contract. Um, and then in combination with various other elements of the uh, skin will give them the coloration that we see as green or blue, orange, yellow, or whatever color the uh, frog or toad may be. And then um, frogs and toads undergo hibernation in the winter. So in the winter months, they will oftentimes bury themselves um, in underground or underneath logs, um, within trees, things like that. Or some that spend most of their time in water will just kind of go underneath the water and stay there. And they can survive even if the water freezes over. And some uh, frogs and toads can actually survive even if 30% of the water inside of their body freezes over. So this is very, very resilient um, animals. But they do undergo hibernation in the winter. And then in the summer um, or when it's spring and warmer months, they will come out of hibernation and start to feed and everything like that and spawn. Frogs and toads use positive pressure to bring air into their lungs. So what they do is they bring air from the environment into their mouths. And then from their mouths, they push the air into their lungs. And then when they're ready to exhale, the air will move from their lungs back into their mouths and then back to the environment. And this is called buccal pumping. And it's a very different mechanism of bringing air into the lungs than what we see in birds and mammals, which we'll talk about a little later. A neurons have a three chambered heart complete with two atria, which you can see here and here, and a single shared ventricle. And despite the fact that the uh, deoxygenated blood and oxygenated blood are both pumped into the ventricle, they don't tend to mix very much, which is very, very beneficial, right? We don't want mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. And one way of keeping the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood from mixing is that neurons use asynchronous atrial contractions. So one atria will contract and then the other will contract. And this helps to keep the blood from mixing. Um, this asynchronous atrial contraction is also different from what we see in mammals and birds. And then uh, neurons also have a few other adaptations that they've uh, evolved for living on land. They have specialized sensory organs that optimize their ability to smell and hear um, different prey and predators in terrestrial environments. So they have better eyesight than lungfin fish, a better sense of smell, um, as well as some other modifications, um, a larger brain um, with more defined regions that help them sense their environment. And then in their larval stage, they still maintain a lateral line. And this we talked about in fish, which is also another indicator of the um, aquatic origins of amphibians and tetrapods in, in general. And once they go from their larval form into their adult form, they lose this lateral line because the lateral line is not really an effective organ to have in a terrestrial animal. Um, instead, they start focusing on developing their other organs that will help with terrestrial life. A neurons undergo external fertilization, followed by metamorphosis into the adult form. And so what will happen is the male and female will join together in a uh, position called aplexus, where the male will grasp onto the back of the female. And so as the female is releasing her eggs, the male will release the sperm to fertilize them. 
and then the eggs will stick on to some sort of substrate um, and will under start to rapidly undergo cell division. And so they'll form a blastula, then they'll you know form a, a young um, a young tadpole, and then that tadpole um, you can see goes through various stages of metamorphosis where they will eventually uh, lose their tail, they'll lose their gills. Um, they'll also lose their lateral line and they'll gain legs, um, they'll gain lungs, and eventually they'll become the adults that are uh, fully terrestrial or partially terrestrial. And some of them um, are actually aquatic. Some frogs and toads spend most of their life um, in the water. And additionally, um, when they're undergoing metamorphosis, there are some other changes that will occur as well. So the larva and, and the juveniles are herbivores, whereas adults are generally carnivores. And this also helps with uh, lim eliminating competition between the larva and the adults. Additionally, due to metamorphosis, there are some structural differences as well. I mean, you can see those very clearly. The tadpoles don't look almost anything like um, the adult frogs. But also, tadpoles have a very clear um, head, trunk, and tail region. However, in the adult frogs, the head and the trunk regions have become fused, so they ha have that kind of new uh, body structure that we all recognize as a frog. So there's a lot of different changes that occur for tadpole as it uh, changes into a frog. Now that we've talked about the quasi-terrestrial amphibians, let's talk about the fully terrestrial reptiles. And we'll begin by looking at the non-avian reptiles. And these include turtles, lizards, snakes, crocodiles, tuataras, and dinosaurs. And then after this, we'll talk about the avian reptiles. And I'm saying avian and non-avian because birds are a form of reptiles. They are descended from a shared common ancestor with non-avian reptiles. And they're actually very closely related to crocodilians. So we'll talk about those next. Um, to make reptiles a monophyletic group, you have to include both the avian and non-avian reptiles. But if you just refer to the non-avian reptiles, it's a paraphyletic group because we're not including birds. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so the non-avian reptiles are fully terrestrial and they are uh, within a group called amniotes. And there are a variety of characteristics that an organism must have to be considered an amniote. One of the biggest ones is they have to have an amniotic egg, right? So in reptiles, we, they have a shelled amniotic egg, and this is why they belong to the amniote clade. And this amniotic egg has a couple of different portions to it, or a couple different um, segments. We have the embryo, clearly, in the center, and then we have a yolk sac. And the yolk sac is the, uh, provides the nutrients for the developing organism. And then outside of the, the uh, yolk sac, we have an amnion that is a thin membrane that surrounds the uh, embryo. And this thin membrane keeps the embryo encased in a fluid environment. So it maintains that water that we need based on our evolutionary history. So instead of having to be uh, eggs laid in water or kept, it, kept moist, instead, they developed an egg that will allow the egg to be laid in a dry environment. However, the embryo can still maintain um, its ability to be in a moist environment because the moisture is retained within the, the egg. And then for outside of that, there is the allantois which is the next membrane and this is highly vascularized and plays a role in waste removal as well as uh, gas exchange. And then in addition to the allantois, we have the chorion and the chorion is also a heavily vascularized and plays a role in respiration. And then finally you have on the outermost uh, region you have the shell and the shell provides protection for the embryo from environmental threats as well as from predators and from uh, disease. So these are the various uh, kind of structures that make up an egg from the inside out. And then there's um, a lot of other characteristics that we're going to talk about from here on out that don't just apply to non-avian reptiles, but would apply to all amniotes. So this would be uh, non-avian reptiles, avian reptiles, and mammals. 
um, to some degree. So any of those characteristics that apply to all amniotes, I've highlighted in blue. So just keep these things in mind. They're not just exclusive to non-avian reptiles. They also apply to all amniotes. Uh, Non-avian reptiles are ectotherms, and they have a very uh, scaly, thick uh, skin, keratinized skin that allows them to live completely in terrestrial environments. And having a waterproof keratinized skin is another characteristic of amniotes as a whole. One thing about, um, about re uh, the reptiles, both birds and uh, non-avian reptiles, they have beta keratin in their skin. And this is unique to reptiles. Um, humans, we have keratin as well, but we only make alpha keratin, not beta keratin. So keep that in mind. And they also have a lipid coating on their skin, which aids in them being waterproof, in addition to the fact that their skin is very, very uh, thick due to this keratinized um, epidermis. And then they also, uh, non-avian reptiles are diapsids. So what this means is that when we're looking at the skull of a reptile, there are additional openings behind the uh, orbital lobe, or orbital opening, that um, are areas for the jaw muscles to attach. So the ancestral characteristic of all uh, reptiles was an anapsid skull, and it looked like this. So when you look at this skull, you just see the orbital opening here, and then there's nothing else. And then from that shared common ancestor, we saw a branching off, and we saw that um, the mammals developed a synapsid skull, which we'll talk about a little bit later when we talk about mammals, but they have a single opening behind the orbital opening. However, reptiles have two openings behind the orbital opening. And this allows for powerful jaw muscles that are used for um, jaw adduction to travel through um, these, these openings and anchor more securely to the skull, which gives them a more powerful bite than their anapsid ancestor. Not all modern day living uh, non-avian reptiles have a diapsid skull. Um, turtles have an anapsid skull, but this is a derived characteristic. They uh, at some point lost their openings behind their orbital lobe, but their shared common ancestor also had a diapsid skull. And these stronger jaw muscles are another characteristic of all amniotes. All amniotes, including the non-avian reptiles, use rib ventilation to bring air into the lungs. And so this is very different from what we saw in amphibians that use buccal pumping, a form of positive pressure, to force air into the lungs. Instead, amniotes, we rely on negative pressure to bring air into the lungs. So how this works is when you're ready to inhale, your intercostal muscles of your ribs will bring your chest, uh, your rib cage, up and outward. And then in addition to this, the diaphragm in mammals or the, the liver in uh, reptiles will be moved more posteriorly. And this will cause the chest cavity to expand. And with the increased space in the chest cavity, air will naturally move from the environment into the lungs. And then when you're ready to exhale, the intercostal muscles will contract, uh, making the uh, rib cage kind of uh, become smaller. And then also your liver and our diaphragm will go back into place. And this causes the chest cavity to become much smaller. And then um, with that constriction, it forces the excess air in the lungs out back into the environment. And so this is how all amniotes undergo respiration. Additionally, all amniotes have high pressure cardiovascular systems. Uh, we have more robust hearts and uh, more robust cardiovascular cardiovascular systems in general, but also the hearts are structurally different. So we talked about in amphibians how they had a three-chambered heart with two atria and uh, one ventricle, and you can see an example in this picture here. Well, in reptiles, the vast majority of reptiles have a uh, two atria and a partially separated ventricle. So it's still three-chambered heart um, because it's not completely separated. However, there is some septation there. And this helps uh, further helps to prevent the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood from mixing. The only reptiles that um, do not have a three-chambered heart are the crocodilians. They have a four-chambered heart, um, just like mammals and birds also have a four-chambered heart.
And this, um, this kind of partial septation is actually not a drawback, it's a benefit because it allows many reptiles to be able to bypass the, um, the lungs when they're not needed. So let's say you're a uh, marine iguana and you're diving into the ocean. You don't wanna have to keep coming up for air over and over again um, in order for your circulatory system to function. So instead of uh, sending the deoxygenated blood to the lungs, what the uh, this iguana would do is bypass the lungs using this right aorta and it will send the blood from the, uh, the ventricle, the right ventricles, through the uh, right aorta, which will then meet up with the left aorta and circulate the blood throughout the bloodstream. So this is a way of bypassing the lungs when um, they're not needed, particularly in um, reptiles that are spending a significant portion of their time in uh, submerged in water. Another thing about um, all amniotes is we found a way to uh, convert ammonia into less toxic excretory waste products. And so in reptiles, both non-avian and avian reptiles, they convert ammonia into uric acid, whereas mammals, we convert ammonia into urea. And this is important because ammonia is highly toxic to animals, um, even at very, very, very small amounts. If we didn't convert ammonia, we just kept it in our body as a waste product, we would also have to keep a large amount of water in our tissues to dilute it out to non-toxic levels. Um, this is not a problem. Um, excretion of ammonia is not a problem for uh, fish and amphibians because they will just excrete ammonia directly into the water um, around them. However, for terrestrial animals, we have to keep our waste with us until we're ready to uh, urinate or defecate. And so what we have to do is convert ammonia to less toxic uh, compounds so that we can concentrate this waste product until we're ready to excrete it. And so having uric acid or urea allows us to uh, do that. It also allows us to conserve on water because these compounds are less toxic. We don't have to dilute them in as much water so we can conserve water in our bodies which of course is very important if you're a terrestrial animal to keep as much water in your tissues as possible. And then finally, all amniotes have larger brains and well-developed sensory organs than what we see in amphibians and fish. Um, one key thing about amniotes is we have a larger cerebellum. And this is the portion of the brain that is more responsible for more complex behaviors, um, like social behaviors, critical thinking, problem solving, um, those types of things. So all amniotes, we're starting to see more um, complex nervous systems and more complex behaviors due to the enlargement of the brain in general, and more specifically, the enlargement of the cerebellum. And then um, all non-avian reptiles undergo internal fertilization and avian reptiles undergo internal fertilization. And this is because if they try to undergo external fertilization, it just wouldn't work. The sperm would not be able to penetrate the shell. So in order for the sperm to uh, meet with the egg for fertilization to occur, they have to undergo internal fertilization. And then as the egg is traveling down um, the female reproductive tract, the shell will be added on and um, then the, the egg will be removed from the body. Looking more closely at the groups of non-avian reptiles, we'll begin with turtles. And turtles belong to order Testudines. All turtles lack teeth and instead have hardened keratinized plates in their mouths they can use for grabbing and gripping onto prey. And so you can see them really well in this picture of an alligator snapping turtle. Um, this guy's a little cute, he's like a little old man. But um, you can see these keratinized plates in the mouth here. And these plates in combination with strong jaws can be exceptionally lethal to any prey that um, comes a little too close to a turtle. In addition to this, um, all turtles are anapsids, and this is a derived characteristic. Um, turtles, like all other reptiles, share a shared common ancestor that was a diapsid. However, throughout turtle evolution, they lost those two additional openings in the skull and instead just have the or orbital opening. Turtles are probably most well known for their shell, and their shell is actually composed of fused vertebrae, um, fused ribs, and some dermal elements um, that have been keratinized. 
and then the, all these pieces come together to provide them a very hard and robust shell. They also have some overlapping keratinized scales on the uh, shell that provide them additional waterproofing and uh, rigidity and strength. And then on their ventral side, turtles have a, a shielding called the plastron. And it's not nearly as thick or dense as the uh, dorsal shell. However, it does still provide some protection for the animal so they can protect themselves dorsally and ventrally. And um, turtles have this unique ability to be able to bring their limbs and their head into their shell um, and basically close themselves up to protect themselves from predators. This is very, very effective because once a turtle is in its shell, it's nearly impossible for a predator to get it out unless the turtle wants to get out of the shell. And this is facilitated by the fact that the uh, scapulas or the shoulder blades of the turtle are located within the ribs rather than being located outside of the ribs. So for us, our um, shoulder blades are located outside of the ribs, so we can't possibly bring our arms into our ribs. However, with a turtle, you can see in this picture up here, um, this is the shell on top, and you can see the scapulas are located beneath the shell or inside of the ribs. And this allows them to be able to bring their limbs and their head into their shell um, when they feel like they're in danger. Now, not all uh, turtles can do this, uh, like an alligator snapping turtle and some other species of turtle cannot do this. However, a lot of turtles can. Some um, aquatic turtles have an additional way of undergoing respiration. They have a highly vascularized cloaca that will allow them to undergo gas exchange. And so let's say you have a um, green turtle or a loggerhead turtle or something like that that's spending a significant portion of time underwater. So they don't have to keep surfacing to uh, breathe. They will allow water to flow in and out of the cloaca and gas exchange can occur there. So this is going to be very useful for um, these aquatic turtles. And then all turtles are oviparous and they must lay their eggs on land, including aquatic um, marine and freshwater turtles. And so this is a picture of what a turtle's nest looks like. Um, uh, there are lots of videos online of turtles um, coming on beaches and laying their eggs and then the, the young hatching and then traveling to the water or wherever they may end up living. Um, these videos can actually be kind of sad because the vast majority of turtle young don't make it to adulthood. But it's very interesting to see how turtles will oftentimes go to where they uh, were born, especially marine turtles, will go to the same spot where they were born to lay their eggs um, over and over and over several generations. And um, the climate plays a major role in the sex of the um, uh, young that will hatch from the eggs. And this is because temperature uh, plays a major role in the sex of the, the young. So for turtles, when the temperatures are um, cooler, you end up with more males. So let's say the temperature you can see from here, if the temperature is between 18 and like 27 degrees Celsius, then the young that hatch will be males. However, once the temperature starts to increase, increase above about 27 degrees, um, we start to see the eggs will be more female. And then between about 27 and 29 degrees, you might start to see variations in how many males and females are born. So climate change has actually been negatively impacting turtles and various other reptiles that rely on temperature to determine sex because we're ending up with um, a lot more female turtles due to warmer climates. And we'll see in crocodiles, um, they also have young that are a uh, young whose sex is dictated by temperature. We're seeing a lot more male um, crocodilians because of warmer environmental temperatures. Where do squamata include lizards and snakes? And lizards and snakes are very effective predators. For one, they have larger brains than amphibians and um, fish, and they also have well-developed sensory organs for sensing their prey. And we'll talk about some of those in the next slide when we talk more closely about snakes. They also have um, very strong jaw muscles and sharp teeth that help them with gripping their prey. 
In addition to that, their skulls are what we call kinetic skull. And this allows them to open their jaws and then snap them closed with a lot of bite force. And you can see um, those kind of that what that structure looks like if you look at this diagram here. And so the kinetic skull is facilitated by uh, several extra joints. So they have joints here, 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 and here. They've drawn them um, in this picture. They've drawn over the bones with kind of more mechanical looking elements. But these are where the, the joints are located in the skull. And when you're following along through this diagram, you can see how those um, bones um, at the more posterior region of the skull will move forward and that will cause the uh, joints in the, in the more, po more anterior region of the skull to open up the jaws. And then when those uh, bones are moved back into place, that will allow the jaw to snap shut with a lot of bite force. And so we'll talk a little bit more about kinetic skulls in snakes in the next uh, couple slides. Um, all lizards and snakes undergo internal fertilization because of what we talked about before, where the sperm cannot enter into uh, the egg to fertilize the egg if the shell is on. So they have to go undergo internal fertilization. However, when it comes to birth, they can be either oviparous, ovoviviparous, or viviparous, depending on the species. And for those that are um, ovoviviparous, um, they tend to uh, hatch their young inside of their uterus. However, some have placentas um, rather than a, um, a yolk to uh, supply their young with nutrients, and that's usually more common in the viviparous um, species. And so, of course, we have our lizards and snakes. And just a few things about lizards. Um, this is a paraphyletic group, and this is because snakes are actually a lineage that branched off of lizards. So when you're referring to lizards alone, um, that is a paraphyletic term unless you um, create a group that includes snakes. And lizards have movable eyelids, which are not present in snakes. Snakes instead have a transparent membrane that covers their eyes, and so they don't blink, which can be a little bit eerie. But um, uh, lizards do have an eyelid, so you will see them blink. And then also lizards have external ears. Um, they may be small, but they do have them, whereas snakes do not have external ears. Snakes are a monophyletic group that branched off of the lizard lineage. And snakes have an elongated body plan, which is very kind of unique body plan of terrestrial organisms. And because of this elongated body plan, they have rearranged organs to uh, accommodate this kind of thin, long body rather than a thicker, shorter uh, body plan. They also lack limbs, and this is a derived characteristic. And we know this is derived because they share a shared common ancestor with uh, lizards which are tetrapods. And in many uh, modern day larger snakes like boa constrictors and pythons, you can sometimes see those vestigial uh, buds of where limbs would have been, but in most snakes, you don't see any indication of them. However, they did have a tetrapod ancestor um, that's shared with lizards, and this is why they are also considered to be tetrapods. Um, like I mentioned before, snakes lack um, eyelids. Instead, they just have a transparent membrane that covers their eye to keep it moist as well as to clear away debris. And snakes, uh, they can hear. They're not deaf. Instead of having an external ear, they have an internal ear. So this is why you can't see their ears, but they can hear what's going on in their environment. Snakes have an extremely kinetic skull. Um, this is one thing that they're pretty well known for, the fact that they can consume prey that's many, many times their size. And this is because their skull is kind of very loosely held together. Instead of their lower jaw being kind of one large piece of bone, they instead have a very flexible piece of tissue that uh, connects the left and right half of their lower jaw. And this flexible piece of tissue allows their lower jaw to expand when they're trying to eat prey. And so this is why a snake can eat something as large as an egg because that lower jaw will expand. And then also the, the bones that make up the rest of their skull are more loosely put together so it'll allow those bones to also kind of expand a little bit farther away from each other to allow their mouths to open up further to get more prey in. 
When consuming prey, this kinetic skull is also efficient because it allows them to have asymmetrical movement of the skull to bring the uh, prey into their digestive tract. So what they can do is they can move the right half of the skull and then uh, anchor the left half, move the right half forward, and then anchor the right half, and like in this case for this egg, and move part of the egg further into the mouth. And then anchor the right half and use the left half to bring more in. So you kind of just inch the food further and further back into the digestive tract um, and then they obviously swallow their food whole and then their digestive system is very very powerful and will break down whatever they've consumed um, down to the fact that they can even break down bone uh, because when the uh, waste of a snake comes out it's basically just uric acid and dust. The snakes often have a lot of accessory um, organs that allow them to sense their prey. So of course we talked about really good eyesight um, as well as being able to hear, but they have really, really good sense of smell as well. And they have two other organs that help them when sensing prey. They have something called the Jacobson's organ, which is located right near where the nose is. And so you can see that in this picture here, they're showing you the Jacobson's organ and it uh, sends signals to the brain about chemicals in the nearby environment. So what a snake will do is they will um, extend the tongue out of their mouth and then they'll bring the tongue back into the mouth um, that has bound to different types of chemicals in the environment. And then any chemicals that have attached to the tongue will be rubbed past the Jacobson's organ. So you can see that's what's happening in this picture here. And so the Jacobson's organ then has chemoreceptors that will recognize different scents and send those signals to the brain, which help the snake know, okay, is there any potential prey in my environment? Uh, what's going on in my environment? Are there any mates in my environment? Things like that. In addition to the Jacobson's organ, many snakes uh, will have pit organs, uh, particularly pythons, boas, and pit vipers. And these pit organs are analogous in all three of these types of animals. However, they perform in similar ways. They allow these animals to be able to sense long wave infrared um, waves. And so they're able to um, basically hunt at night as well as they can in the daylight because they don't necessarily have to rely on sight at night to hunt. Instead, they can sense infrared waves from potential prey and then follow that um, heat signature to catch their prey um, even in the dead of night. And then also uh, when they catch their prey, snakes have a couple of ways of incapacitating them. Uh, we talked about uh, swallowing prey whole, they all do that, but some of them swallow prey whole and live, uh, which is a really bad way to go. Um, but this can be very dangerous as well to the snake, because if you have um, prey that's fighting back, that can cause problems for you internally, especially if it's larger prey. So instead of many snakes will constrict their prey, so they'll wrap themselves around the prey and then um, as the prey is exhaling, they will get tighter and tighter and basically suffocate the prey, um, killing it and that way it's a little bit safer for them to consume. Another thing is um, some snakes are venomous. Um, not very many snakes are venomous, at least in the United States and other countries, uh, the number of venomous snakes will vary. However, they can use venom to incapacitate their prey as well. Um, some snakes use neurotoxins, which target the nervous system and shut down the nervous system of their prey. Um, others use hemotoxin, which will um, target the circulatory system of their prey, causing them to basically bleed out from the inside out. And then they also have proteases in their uh, venom that will start degrading the proteins of the prey, breaking it down, making it easier for them to consume. Uh, most snakes have a combination of neurotoxins, hemotoxins, and proteases. Um, it just depends on the different snake species. So there are a couple different ways that snakes can find their prey using their eyes, nose, ears, um, Jacobson's organs, and then when, when present, uh, pit organs. And then they, once they catch their prey, they can either eat their prey live, they can suffocate their prey through constriction, or they can uh, kill their prey chemically using venom. Crocodiles, alligators, caimans, and gharials all belong to order Crocodilia. If you've never seen a gharial, this is what they look like down here. And crocodilians are the sister group to birds. And this is because birds are descended from dinosaurs. 
So it's no wonder that birds are very closely related to some of our most ancient non-avian reptiles out there, the crocodilians. So you can see from this uh, phylogenetic tree here that crocodiles and birds share a more recent common ancestor to each other than either of those groups share with turtles, um, lizards and snakes, and especially mammals. And crocodilians have a couple of features about them that make them stand out even amongst all other non-avian reptiles. For one, they have secondary palates and thecodont dentition. And the secondary palate is only found in mammals as well as thecodont dentition. And secondary palate allows these animals to be able to breathe while their mouth is full with water, prey, or both. Um, so you can test this out on you as a mammal. You can fill your mouth up with water and then you can still breathe. But um, most other reptiles besides crocodilians do not have this capability. If they need to breathe, they need to reposition their re respiratory opening so that they can breathe effectively while they're eating food or while their mouth is full with other substances. Um, but crocodilians don't have to worry about that. Also, crocodilians have thecodont dentition. And so this is unique amongst um, non-avian reptiles as well because most um, non-avian reptiles have either acrodont or pleurodont dentition, where their teeth are either superficially or kind of loosely associated with the jaws. However, when you have thecodont dentition, like we have in mammals um, and in the crocodilians, which you can see here, the teeth is anchored into a um, opening or a notch in the skull. And this allows for the teeth to be a lot more secure and uh, stronger when you're catching prey and things like that. Um, additionally, another characteristic about crocodilians that sets them apart from other non-avian reptiles is the presence of a four-chambered heart. Um, most reptiles have a three-chambered heart that has partial septation. However, um, the crocodilians, like birds and mammals, have a four-chambered heart with two atria and two ventricles. And then all crocodilians are oviparous. Uh, this is not unique amongst non-avian reptiles. Uh, a lot of non-avian reptiles are also oviparous. But one thing that's unique about them is the amount of parental care that they provide to their young. So most non-avian reptiles do not provide any um, care to their young, or they may protect their eggs, but as soon as their young hatch, they leave. But a lot of crocodilians will uh, not only just protect their nests, but they'll also protect their young for a certain period of time while the young are uh, growing and developing. And so this is a very unique characteristic um, that uh, you can start to see a lot more similarities between the crocodilians and the birds because birds also give a lot more care to their young as they're growing and developing. And then another thing about crocodilians um, is that they're like turtles, the sex of their young is determined by environmental conditions, but it's opposite to what we saw in turtles. So in crocodilians, if the temperature is higher, then their young will be mostly males. And if the temperature is lower, then their young will be mostly females. And just like turtles, uh, crocodilians are being negatively impacted by climate change as temperatures tend to be warmer and warmer. So we're ending up with far more male crocodilians um, and far fewer female crocodilians.